Okay, uh, next month, uh, April, we've got uh, Paul Mahaffey. Uh, Paul has just retired as uh, the director of the uh, uh, Solar System Exploration Division. And uh, so Paul's come, coming out. He will uh, tell us about Goddard's contributions to the exploration of planets, moons, primitive bodies in the solar system. I mean, Goddard is an awesome place. And the, the solar system exploration is one of those things that people dream about doing. We've done it here. And Paul is going to come out and, and uh, tell us, uh, you know, summarize what, what we've accomplished over the, the last decades. Um, April, in, in, in May, uh, it's still open. We're hoping that Michelle Toller can come back and actually give her talk this time. Uh, don't have confirmation on that yet. Well, today uh, our speaker is Matt Radcliffe. Now, uh, if you've noticed one thing that's happened at Goddard over uh, since you know, over the last 50 years is we've gone from an organization that built spacecraft instruments, collected data, the data went to scientists for analysis, and we got publications out of it, and we got scientific advancements. Well, that's not the NASA of today. Right now, um, our Office of Communication is a good example of how our outreach has changed. We, we don't just collect data for pure, really scientific purposes, but the scope of uh, a data release is, is completely changed now. Anyway, uh, uh, man has a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in chemistry, and from that point, he jumped out of the scientific field and went into video uh, editing, and spent some time out in Montana at a school which I hadn't heard of uh, before in Bozeman, but it, uh, it, it produces scientific visualizations and, and, and edits scientific field. Um, now, uh, Matt's primary focus has been in the Landsat area, and and he's uh, uh, had some interesting time. Spent a, what, uh, I, I believe a month on, on the top of uh, Greenland. Uh, just a week. A week. Yeah, a week. It took a while to get there. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, he, he's also uh, built a uh, uh, touch screen. Uh, um, exhibit over at the Visitor Center and, and also has uh, 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 produced Goddard's uh, annual events uh, down at the Air and Space Museum. So anyway, Matt's going to tell us about bringing NASA's story down to the Earth. Okay, hi. Uh, thanks all for coming. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm Matt Radcliffe. I'm the video producer uh, at the Office of Communications at Goddard. Um, and I think we have quite an, I think quite an accomplished group of video producers um, and science writers. So I think most of us are senior. <laughs> Our title is senior. We, we don't have that many um, junior producers. Um, and I will, I will say, uh, Building off of what Arlen had said, um, I was talking with our executive producer, the sort of head of the multimedia at the Office of Communications, and I think we think it's probably the largest collection of science video makers, uh, probably anywhere. Uh, and when you add in the writers that we have here at Goddard, uh, just in terms of science communication, Goddard is one of the biggest organizations for science communication all by itself. There's a lot of other people that are doing it, so we're not big in, in we're not overwhelming in that sense, but as a unit, we're probably the biggest. Um, okay, so this is the homepage for Goddard's website. Um, how many of you people, if you go to the web browser, have, have, have you made this your homepage? That's what that's what I do. This is what when I open up my web browser, this is what I see. It's one of the only ways I can kind of keep track of all the stuff, all the stories that we're putting out, and all the stuff that's happening around. Um, and so here is you can you can link to 
Um, all the stories that we put out, all the press releases, videos, uh, they all end up on this homepage. Um, sometimes they're only there for a blink because we're putting so many out that they get pushed down to the, to the bottom. Um, but that's one way that you'll find our stuff. Uh, but why, I think, well, um, NASA as a whole, these numbers uh, are actually, I think, from 2012, but they're still pretty, pretty representative. Um, NASA, as, as uh, Arlen was saying and Tony was saying, we do amazing things. Um, and we also invest in industry. Uh, like a quarter of our budget goes back into manufacturing to build the spacecraft, to build the instruments. Um, it, we spur you know, innovation and growth. Um, and we also, uh, science diplomacy, uh, you know, our, our outreach and connections with other countries, that's all a part of the diplomacy. But nobody would know about these things if we didn't have our communications office. Well, they would know about some of them, I guess. Some of them are pretty big. Um, so we've got, uh, again, these numbers are old, but we've got um, millions and millions of followers. I think NASA alone has more than 100, a couple hundred different types of social media accounts, different platforms, different programs. They're trying to winnow it down because it's a little, it's a little daunting. But, um, the other part is, the other two parts that I would point out are the educational work that we do. Millions of students are watching uh, and reading the stuff that we put out, uh, and it's being incorporated into classrooms all the time. Uh, and then our data sets, the data that, that the scientists collect, um, that's all publicly distributed. Um, and maintaining that is, is a big task, I think. Um, so the Office of Communication covers a, a bunch of things that, that got her. So news, that's one of, you know, kind of maybe our foremost thing. Um, stories, you know, feature stories, press releases, that kind of a thing. Um, but we also do a lot of multimedia, videos um, and other types of visual productions. Um, this is a, uh, a video I had done on Landsat and um, Landsat data being used to map crop lands in the country. Uh, and all of our videos, as I'll talk about, um, are available on a YouTube channel, but they go in lots of other places as well. Uh, and then we have an internal communications group, so the Dateline emails that come out, um, the gate signs, engage sessions, um, newsletters. This is a, a very active group that's just reaching to Goddard employees and contractors. Uh, we have a we used to have a very active visitor center. It's been a little quiet the last two years. Um, but we've got uh, both the Goddard and Wallops. And we have, um, they've started doing what they call virtual field trips. Since they can't bring tour groups to Goddard to do tours, they've been doing these um, virtual ones. They've gone very well. Um, they're doing them every week. And they are very close to having one from every state. So these are school groups or other organizations that arrange to have a field trip um, that is all done virtually. Um, but they've been, you know, the, the schools, there's a lot of schools, um, they've been really super excited to get to see Goddard even though they're coming from California or Idaho or somewhere. Um, and then the public engagement and outreach group. They've also been a little bit, uh, they've had to shift what they do a little bit over the last two years. Uh, this, this set of pictures is from an event they did uh, in 2019, that was called Boys Night In. So they had 50 some teenage boys that came and um, took a tour of Goddard, met some scientists and engineers, did some projects, spent the night here. Uh, they've done this with girls a lot um, as well, usually every year. Uh, but they do, anytime there are sort of events that they go out to, this is the team that does that. Uh, and a lot of that, again, there's been a lot of virtual stuff over the last two years. So, um, as I said, all of our videos are on the Goddard YouTube channel or one of the other sort of YouTube channels that, that NASA has. Uh, the main reason for that is because it, that's how we feed videos into the NASA websites. They live on YouTube and then they get sort of linked over to the websites. It's just much easier. We're not the only people that do that. It's much easier to have YouTube handle the back end side of things. Um, and deal with the infrastructure of having lots of views. Um, 
But this is sort of the standard kind of thing where we have uh, our channel, we have, um, uh, I would say, either sort of entertaining or educating. It's a mix of entertainment and education. Um, there are, um, sometimes we film lectures and or um, some press, press briefings and stuff. And those we still put on YouTube, but we have a separate channel so that, that uh, the, let's say, the stuff for a very small audience or slightly more dry go to a separate channel, the main Goddard channel. Um, you should be, you know, it's sort of what I say, all the hits. That's where all the good stuff goes. Um, okay, but we have a lot of other platforms, as I said. Twitter is a big one. Um, there's a lot of engagement with the public through Twitter. Uh, I like it because we can take a story and we can break it into like um, small chunks, right? But we can break it into bullet points, and each one will be sort of uh, threaded. They call it a thread where you connect all the individual tweets, and so you can you can tell your story in a different way and put in lots of visuals. If you just do a feature story um, on the web page, you might only get a couple of visuals, but you can break it apart into the main points and get a, a visual for every one. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I know you can't read that. <laughs> but it was the only way to get uh, to shrink it down so I could get a thread of them. And that's only, that's only a portion of it. It actually continued before and, and after. Um, Facebook is also a big one, uh, a little bit less active than Twitter. We put a lot of uh, uh, pictures and videos there. Uh, but one thing that we do a lot of through Facebook is um, our sort of expeditions when we go with uh, scientists who are out in the field or um, testing things. Um, we, we will, when we do videos about them, they do very well on Facebook and we'll also sometimes do live events, live streaming of an interview or having a scientist or an engineer show us something. Um, and most of these uh, platforms, there's feedback where they'll leave comments and then or ask questions and we try to answer them. Oh yeah, so this is, this is uh, uh, a recent expedition where they're measuring um, in a snowstorm just uh, in February. Okay. Uh, Instagram is another one um, which is just driven by pictures uh, for the most part and we have a lot of very visual things to show. So we have, uh, have had a very active Instagram account for a while. Um, The other, um, <laughs> we don't do, the other thing that we do um, that, that's sort of a big part of what we do are live broadcasts uh, for TV or for streaming on, um, on the web. Facebook might be one way uh, that we do. We do a lot of our live events get streamed through Facebook because they make it easy to connect it there. Um, we don't do these all the time because they tend to be kind of a big production, but they're, they make a big splash. So these are pictures from the James Webb launch uh, on Christmas. Um, the picture on the left is the, the set, and then on the right are two of the control rooms that we had behind the scenes making it all work. Um, there's actually a third, a third control room as well that couldn't fit the picture in. Uh, this took a lot of crew, and it was very difficult um, having the launch be right on the holidays, so we had to scale back at the last minute. Um, and then another, uh, another avenue for getting our, our stories out is through press briefings. So I've got two examples, both from Landsat, because that's what I, that's what I had. Um, on the left is a recent one from last fall when Landsat 9 launched. Um, and we were uh, unable to do it. Uh, it was around the time that uh, the Omicron wave was, was kicking into gear. Uh, and so we were uh, uh, yeah, unable to do that in person, and so we had a virtual press briefing. So everybody was in their own office or hotel room, um, and uh, the press called in to ask their questions. On the right is a press briefing from 10 years ago. That was the 40th anniversary of Landsat. We had a big event at the New Zoo, which doesn't exist anymore. But uh, there was press, and there was a, a, a tour. We had done, given people a tour of Goddard, and then they came to the event and got to ask questions. Um, this was a big production. Uh, so we have both uh, a range of ways to do press briefings. 
So, um, in terms of what we do, the, the types of products that we make, the things that we cover, the stories that we tell, um, the first thing is, is documenting the projects. So pretty much all flight projects, we have a crew that is filming as they're constructing the satellite or instruments. Um, uh, and it goes, continues on through the sort of shipping process, testing process, all the way to launch. So these are all, um, uh, the two on the left are tiers, uh, the tiers instrument from Landsat 8, and then um, I can't remember if it's Landsat 8 or Landsat 9 arriving. Uh, I think it's Landsat 8 arriving at Vandenberg Air Force Base for launch. Um, we also sometimes uh, go out into the field, as I mentioned, and do these field campaigns. Um, that's really had been picking up the intensity of those, and NASA had been doing a lot more Earth science expeditions um, right before the pandemic that they had been picking up. And so we've started to, to, started to go out in the field again, but just in small amounts. Um, the picture on the left is from when I was in Greenland for a week up at the top of the ice, ice sheet, which is almost 11,000 feet in elevation. And um, I got altitude sickness. <laughs> we, we took a plane from sea level up to the top of the ice sheet. So in about an hour and a half, I went up 11,000 feet and couldn't figure out why I felt so terrible. Uh, and on the right, I'm in the California dunes, the Algodonis dunes. Uh, park in California where they were um, uh, doing some validation measurements with uh, Landsat 8. Um, we have a group that does animations. We call them conceptual animations. Um, uh, I think their name is the, the Conceptual Image Lab. Um, they do really great, uh, really great work. So we use them when we want to describe a, a process or a concept. Um, on the left here is an example of evapotranspiration, where the soil's water is evaporating from the soil and transpiring from the leaves of the plant. Um, Landsat uses that um, process to, when they measure the temperature, they can determine how much water a farm field has used. Um, so it's useful in tracking irrigation uh, and monitoring water rights. Um, on the right is an example, one of the main things that the conceptual animators do um, the main things that, 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 that in some ways makes us unique are these really great models of the spacecraft that then we can use for animations. So they take the engineering files and turn out uh, Hollywood uh, level animations. And it just happens that that's me <laughs> for scale next to Gozar. <laughs> um, they had done for, for one of the projects, they wanted some humans to kind of be a scale. So they filmed us against the green screen and then stuck us in. But it was cool that it, it was me. Um, we have a data visualization group. They're not technically in the Office of Communications. They're in Code 600. But we work very, very closely. Um, and every time, we, every time we launch a new Earth observing mission, we end up making a new one of these visualizations of the fleet. So this is the Earth fleet um, as of last fall, I think. So the GOES T is not in here yet. Well, actually, Ghost T wouldn't be because it's a geostationary. This is just a low Earth orbit. Um, but along with, uh, along with this sort of telemetry data, um, they visualize all kinds of things. So the, the, difference, the key difference between the conceptual animators and the data visualizers uh, is that the data visualizers are working with actual sort of science data. So this is from the GPM mission, the Global Precipitation Measurement mission. And we're going to look inside the hurricane at the actual raindrops um, that are inside. So GPM can measure the volume of those raindrops and the distribution. So you can see the bands of rain in the hurricane. And then another one, uh, this is sort of interesting, it's sort of two, two takes on the same data. This is the global temperature. Uh, we do an update every January of what the temperature of the globe is. Um, for years, we've been making the visualization, visualization on the left where you see uh, blue is colder than average and red is warmer than average. Um, from 1880, when we started collecting some solid enough data around the globe to make, a, make an argument for the whole globe. Um, and you can see it's getting redder and redder over time. Um, and that shows, on the left, it shows the distribution around the planet. So on the right is just the, 
a different way to look at the same data. This is the, the global average for each month. And so it's going in a spiral for each month around in a year. Um, and you can see it just gives a sort of different, a different way of looking at the growth or the increase in temperature over the years. Um, so again, a blue is colder than average and uh, red is warmer than average. And as we, as we get farther, <laughs> farther along, closer to today, it gets better and better. And when it gets to the end, it, it, it rotates sideways, and you can have a, a third perspective on the same day. So the color and the, the spacing, right, the, the diameter of the circle, is also indicative of the increase in temperature. Um, when we, we take all this, uh, this, these inputs, and we make different kinds of videos, and you know all these, and all these end up as illustrating stories that our writers write. Um, this is a very short promo for the Lucy mission, but a, a sort of fun style. They they did a series of these uh, of videos about the Lucy mission, um, explaining what the goal is and how it's going to work. Really aimed at kids, uh, and they're they're really fun, I should say. Um, we do a lot of um, a lot of videos about the engineering and the technology at Goddard. Uh, all that documentation of flight projects. This is one of the one of the ways we use that. I'll play a little bit of this because I think it's pretty. Cool. Uh, so what we have here is the optical bench, uh, which has a lot of transmitter components on it, which is where the laser starts uh, before it bounces off a bunch of mirrors and goes out towards Earth to measure that. Uh, so the laser comes out of the box uh, off of the fold mirror, and the fold mirror folds at 90 degrees, so it comes out towards the rest of the bench. Uh, then it encounters this optic, which is the polarizing beam combiner, uh, or the PBC, uh, which sends the light in two different directions. Uh, so it picks off a small percentage of light to go through a periscope and into the laser sampling assembly. So one of the channels in the LSA is the start pulse detector, which is basically the stopwatch of starting and stopping that timer for how long it's going to take the photons to get back down to measure the ice and back. That was the, um, that, that was the, uh, the Atlas instrument that was built here at Goddard for ISAT-2, uh, and it uses pulses of photons to, to measure the distance from the satellite to Earth and back up. Um, and it's intended to track the height of ice sheets and sea ice levels. My colleague did, did a really great job. He did a series of three of those where they sort of went through each step of, uh, they did the instrument, they did um, how it works in the satellite, and then the, how they do the timing uh, of getting the photon, timing the photon to Earth and back up to the satellite. Um, science results. The other, I think, thing that we do a lot of is uh, stories about science results. If, science, if a paper was written, um, or just there's some really interesting science that's happening, um, we, we may do sort of a survey of that work. And this visualization is one that I, I worked on for deforestation in the Amazon, uh, using Landsat data over 30 some years, um, tracking what what is on the land surface each year. So you can see in a second it will start going forward in time, and you'll see the um, change from forest to cropland and pasture. So the orange areas are um, crops, uh, and the sort of yellow areas are pasture, usually cattle. And we also put in um, fires, because the fires in the Amazon are connected with clearing the land for crops and pasture. Uh, and then another, another thing that we talk about, especially in earth science, is the applications of the data and how that benefits society. This is a rev reservoir in Utah, and so they could use the Landsat data to look at the algae and kind of determine how much algae is there and map um, uh, map out where there's going to be high concentrations of algae, and then um, local officials could go and measure to see if it's harmful algae or not. 
next generation satellites will probably be able to tell from the satellite data, is that harmful algae or not? Um, we don't do that many of these, but we do some events um, where we reach a large number of people at once. This is actually, this is from just a couple weeks ago. I think it's the National Philharmonic out at Strathmore. They did a concert where they um, did the, the piece, The Planets, from Planet Pulse. Uh, I grew up. I grew up playing in the orchestra, so we played that many times. Uh, but one of our one of our team members put together um, a string of visuals to go with the music. So as the orchestra played, it was our visualizations on the screen behind them. And they did a, at the same concert. They also did a piece La Mer uh, about the sea. And so we had a lot of our sea visualizations, ocean visualizations. Uh, we had done these once, I think, once or twice before the pandemic. Uh, and it was on the books to do more, but it got delayed by two years. Uh, so it's nice to have them back. Uh, and then another thing, these have really picked up. When I started here, we did a couple of these a year. Uh, we call them live shots. We used to call them satellite uh, media tours as well. And this is when we have our scientists or engineers, our talent, uh, would be interviewed by local TV stations. So we start in the morning and start on the East Coast and work way to the West Coast. Um, and all the sort of morning TV shows will have five minutes where they interview our scientists about a project. Um, we've built up the team that does this and now we do them once or twice a month. And with the pandemic we went virtual so they don't, you know, in the previous times they would come to our, the talent would come to our studio. We'd have one person at a time. We would send the, the feed up to the satellite and the stations would TV stations would pull it from the satellite and put it right into their broadcast. So that you, you see these if you turn on the, if you watch any morning show, you're going to see interviews like this, um, where the, the person they're interviewing is in another city. So we would do that now, um, in the, the last two years, uh, because we've had our studio shut down, we've been doing them virtually where uh, the, the talent is just at home or in a, a hotel room if they're at a launch. Um, or they might be in their office, uh, and they're connecting by Skype or by Zoom. Um, but we have set it up. We, we set it up, set it all up, make the connections. There's a every talent has a buddy that helps them make sure that it's working all correctly. Uh, and we have tripled the number of these that we can do, maybe quadrupled. We used to do 20 to 30 on a good day, 40 to 50 on a great day, and now we routinely do 50 to 100 or more if it's a big thing. And uh, um, it used to just be Goddard, but now uh, the whole agency has sort of been using power services to do this. So um, we've done this for uh, the crew the crew missions with um, SpaceX. We'll do it with Artemis, um, a couple of other things. So that's become something that Goddard has really become a power force, a force in the agency, is that we're, we're organizing these and driving these. Um, the one on the left is from January when we did a series of these interviews about the global temperature update. Um, and so this is sort of what it looks like, right? You've got the, the, the station will have the expert in a little box and then they'll have some visuals that they're talking about. Um, sometimes they might just have the visuals full screen. And then the other, uh, the other one here is the DART mission um, from last fall. And this is another kind of common setup, what we call double boxes, where the interviewer is in one box and the interviewee, the talent, is in another box. Um, and then when, when they ask the question, it'll be like this. And then when the talent starts to answer, they go to full screen on the talent or they cut to the visuals. Um, but this is a big way that we get our word out. So I wanted to run through um, quickly the um, the Landsat 9 launch. So Landsat 9 launched in September last year. Uh, I worked on it very closely, so I, I know <laughs> I know this plan pretty well. But it was a good it was a good plan. It was well executed, and we got a big payoff. Um, and it uses a lot of the different methods that I just talked about. Uh, so I was just going to run through that to give you a sense of how it works in a in a, in a, in a strategic way. For Landsat 9, we started. Um, thinking about it, of the, of the launch 12 months in advance. Some of that was because they kept moving the launch on us. 
So it was, it was going to be closer to the launch when we started, but it ended up working in our favor because we had more time to do more stuff. Um, but we, we had a lot of pieces that we used all together to tell the story of Landsat 9. And the, you, know, you can't really talk about Landsat 9 without talking about the first eight as well. Um, so a year in advance, we had uh, done a four-part video series that we called Continuing the Legacy about how 